Hey guys, my name is Graham Johnson and welcome back to Tabletop Glory. Today we're going to be talking about the Gargantuan Dragon by WizKids. Now one of the cool things about this miniature is it has a large base that comes with the dragon. Now you don't necessarily need to use it, but in this case I would recommend it as one of its paws is up in the air and as a direct result of that it's kind of tippy. Now one of the great things about this large flat base is it's a great place to tell a story. And I think today's project we tell a really great story about a green dragon protecting protecting an ancient secret. After all, you'll notice I didn't include a treasure pile, which is something most dragons are known for hoarding. In any case, I think you guys will really find today's video interesting on how I kind of laid everything out and my thought process behind choosing where everything goes and maybe give you guys a bit more insight into how I do my large decorative bases or even small bases for that fact. Everything tells a story. Now I had originally wanted to add the brick facing toward the rock and I thought that this would help to facilitate adding more bricks to help tell more of a story but I realized that that was just creating more of a pain to try to work around so I ended up changing this last minute. However, despite this last minute change that I decided to make, this ended up causing more problems for me in the short term as I now needed to trim down the rocks to make them fit or I needed to trim down the brick. Now in my case, trimming down plaster is no big deal. You use a straight edge razor, bing bada boom, it should be done. However, I didn't anticipate the amount of glue I had used to lock everything down and I ended up really struggling with the super glue. But after a little bit of fighting, I ended up punching through and locking everything down. So in order to lock down my bricks, I ended up having to cut some notches in them to get around the big nodule of super glue that ended up getting left over. I just couldn't cut through it with my straight edge razor and I didn't want to hurt myself or the rocks because making these can be a bit of a pain sometimes. Now I should have changed out my razor as you can see here my blade is kind of dull and is just tearing the foam instead of actually cutting it. Uh, but I just wanted to power through it and get the job done. Uh, and it's not a big deal because this is going to get covered up anyway, so it wasn't the end of the world. As you can see here, I'm just being super careful because unfortunately I am having to cut toward my fingers. Um, I should have put this against the desk just to be on the safe side, but I know my skills and I knew I'd be okay. And so I'm just going to go ahead and pop that free and then I'm going to smear some glue on that and lock it in place. Always remember to do a test fit when you're removing material just in case you end up having to cut more out. Now if you really want to make your bricks here look really realistic, you can find yourself a, a big old rock outside and kind of lightly mash up the outside of your brick. Uh, in my case I used two or three different kinds of lava rocks that I had out in the garden and we just kind of mashed those up against this foam to get a big variety of texture. Now I end up doing this across all the bricks that are added uh, but I only showed this one on camera to kind of show you how I go about adding texture. Now if you don't have anything like a lava rock it's no big deal. You can ball up some tin foil kind of loosely and use those rough edges on the tin foil to do the exact same thing. So while I go ahead and lock everything down here, I just wanted to go over how I cut out my bricks and how I determine their size. So regardless of what size brick, this is the formula that I like to use. I try and use whatever material is available to me and I adjust it to be that height so that I'm not adding more work for myself. If I had something like a hot wire proxon, which can be a bit of an expensive tool, I might slim down my bricks and make them slightly smaller. But in my case and in your case, why make your job harder than it needs to be? If you don't have a fancy tool like that, don't worry about it. Go ahead and make your brick height or its thickness the exact same height as your material. So in my case, it's a quarter inch foam, so it's a quarter inch thick brick. And then in order to get the width of the brick, I try to make it the same as the height or slightly larger, maybe 1.25% larger. Not very much at all. Now how do we get the length of the brick? Well the length of the brick ends up being 2.5 times the height of the brick. And I do that across the board regardless of the size of brick, regardless of what type of project I'm doing, and I find that the scale looks really realistic. So now that we've talked about how to make new bricks, 
what we're doing here is we're using old bricks and so the way to do old bricks is just to go ahead and take your razor blade and slice off the edges of all of your bricks it doesn't have to be perfect angles you can have little wonky lines you can have a little bit of a deep gouge in places this is going to do a really great job at making your bricks look weathered and then obviously you need to texture those surfaces with the rock as well so if you're doing old bricks do all of your cuts first cut out your pieces cut off your edges then texture it with the rock it's going to look great and now comes for one of the arguably more important parts. We need to blend these rock faces in with each other as well as blending them in with the bricks we've just made. Now the biggest way that I recommend doing that is out of the same material that you've made your rocks from. So if they're plaster rocks, you wanna add plaster. If you've used some other method like the tin foil method, which I know we don't do on this channel because I personally don't like the way they look, you need to blend them in with more tin foil. If anybody wants a video about that, I'll be happy to do that. But for now, you can see here I'm just using some plaster. It's really easy to use. Even if you're not using plaster rocks, I recommend using plaster as your filler. You just take a little bit of water, your finger, an old paintbrush, whatever. Wipe down, get the plaster off where you don't want it. Keep it where you do want it. And as it dries, just keep an eye on it and stipple it with a brush every now and again while it dries. And you'll get this really realistic dirt texture at the very least. And you can even carve in some straight lines in places to give it more of a rock texture. This is really great for just kind of blending in all over on your piece, especially for these large, almost diorama style bases. So at this point, we're gonna be using a green stuff roller. But Graham, I hear you ask, what on earth do I do if I don't have a green stuff roller? Well, that's great because green stuff rollers can be expensive despite how great they are to have. So how do we get around them? So a really great way to get around not having something like a green stuff roller is to actually use bases, decorative bases in fact. Now although this one is made of green stuff and is a roller in and of itself, we can use things like this in the same way we would use a green stuff roller. Just find something that's got the texture you wanna impart on it, especially if it's something like a giant scroll from like an Age of Sigmar model, it's gonna be deep enough to leave a mark. And just get it super wet with some water and stick it in instead of rolling it across like you would with a green stuff roller. You can use shields, you can use emblems, you can use all kinds of stuff from a lot of different things in our hobby to leave these marks behind, whether it be Warhammer, Age of Sigmar, other D&D stuff. It's a really great way to use what you have available to you to get the exact same result that we would get from something like a green stuff roller. In order to get it nice and flat like I did, I just left the roller inside the tube and used the tube as a rolling pin to get it nice and flat. Now if you don't have something like that, wrap something round in something like saran wrap and get it nice and tight so there's no wrinkles and you can roll that over the surface. You can use something like a full soda can or a full bottle of soda, it works really great. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take our roller or whatever you want to leave the mark with and you want to really lightly start from one end and go to the other and kind of roll it through. Now it's okay if it comes up like it did with mine, you can just kind of scrunch it back up, roll it back out flat again and just do it again. It's not the end of the world. I usually don't get it right the first time either. Sometimes you can line the rollers back up and do it a second time. In my case here, you can see I just butchered it and I gotta do it again. It's no big deal, just get it wet, wipe it all down, get all that detail gone and then roll it again. 12 hours later. So yeah, I had to spend about 12 hours letting it completely cure and then I used this straight edge razor blade to scrape it up. If you don't have something fancy like that, you can use a regular razor blade. I recommend taking it out of whatever holder you have it attached to so you can get it nice and flat so you don't cut into it. And once you kind of get a whole side up, you can usually get a hold of it with your fingers and pull the whole thing up off the table. And then so what I want to do here now is I want to kind of match the curvature of the brick. So I'm going to go ahead and start trimming away pieces until I kind of match that curvature. And I'm going to be using these pieces to kind of fill in the blanks along the edge and you'll see here in just a second. 
So as you can see here, waste not, want not, if it's got some logo on it or it's got some edge of the roller attached to it in some way, go ahead and lock that back down wherever you've got a blank space and then wherever these big open spaces are is fine. We're gonna fill that in with ground texture. Now you can use something like Battlemire or Vallejo ground texture or anything like that. Uh, personally, I have my own mix of products that I like to use that I think looks just fine and then I add a little Battlemire on top of it to kind of help blend it all in. Now, in my case, I am going to be painting this afterwards, so I don't really care what blend of colors of products are going on at this stage. And if you're following along and you plan to paint it as well, it shouldn't really matter to you either. As long as you get the effect that you're after, don't worry about the color of the product. Now I've skipped a little bit forward here. We've gone ahead and primed everything in gray. Now we're going to be making this start to look more like stone and we're gonna be using a method called leopard spotting. Now we're going to be using washes for this and we're gonna be using colors like Athonian Camo Shade, uh, Earth Shade, Seraphim Sepia, maybe a little bit of Nalm Oil, Fugan Orange, Reichland Flesh Shade. We're going for that kind of a color palette. Now in my case with big flat surfaces, I like to wet them down ahead of time. It helps the paint to kind of just smooth over and get into all those nooks and crannies. And it's fine if we get a little bit on the dirt texture because we're gonna cover it up soon anyway. But we're just kind of putting it on in places, allowing it to pool in others. And we're gonna do this across all the rock. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna place all these colors down and it's gonna look really weird and you're gonna think, my God, I've ruined this. And you may wanna take a break, let things dry, put down one color at a time, that's perfectly fine, but it's gonna look really funky, it's gonna look really weird, and it's absolutely okay. When we go to do the dry brushing later, it's gonna look great. So this is one of those trust the process things. Just know that you wanna go a little bit heavier on the orange, the Seraphim Sepia, which is a yellow color, and mostly go a little heavy on darker colors, like your Athonian Camo Shade and your Agrax Earth Shade. Now I am going quite heavy with the Fugan Orange here because I wanted this to look like an unnatural stone. I wanted it to look like something was special. But if you were going for a natural stone look, those earthy colors are the ones you want to stick with, the stereotypical earthy colors. Now I am using Athonian Camo Shade and that's kind of to give the illusion of like some moss or algae kind of growing from a lot of moisture in the air. And that's why I go a little bit heavier with it later on. You'll see what I'm talking about. It becomes pretty obvious where I put it. So as you can see, things look pretty freaky right now, but it's a trust the process moment. And as we start to lay in more dry brushing, things are going to start to look more like stone. Now this is where we really want to start deciding what kind of stone we want things to look like. Now obviously if you wanted to do something like slate or whatever, or even something super dark like maybe warp stone, if you were doing an Age of Sigmar thing, you might want to start out with a darker base tone instead of starting out from gray and leper spotting on top of that. If not, it's no big deal. You can start in with some darker colors for your first dry brush and move into brighter ones. Now in my case, I'm using gray and white. I mix them 50-50 for the next stage and then pure white at the end. You'll see right now that I'm putting on some gray and I end up dry brushing all the way up through white. And it's kind of obvious where I go a little bit overboard and I end up putting more washes down and then dry brushing again. That's perfectly fine if you have the same issue where things start to look less like stone and start looking like styrofoam again. Go ahead, add a few more washes back down, let it dry, put on some more dry brushing layers, go all the way back up to white as your pure highlight. Now when it comes to white as your pure highlight, you're barely putting any on at all. You really, really don't wanna go heavy with the white because that's when it starts to look cartoonish. So stick more to the grays, a little bit of white in some places, go a little heavier on the brick. It'll kind of help to distinguish between the stone and the brick. But yeah, that is how I do that. That is how I kind of get all those textures in when I do stone and rock and brick and things like that. It's all in the dry brushing and it's all by starting with the leopard spotting technique first. Okay, now for some of the more fun stuff actual basing products. So this can range everywhere from static grass to foam flock. We're going to be using a lot of foam flock to start with. This is going to help sell the illusion of moss and grass and things like that that are growing the really small stuff. And then the static grass that we add on top of that is going to look more like wild grown grass. You can see here I'm just using some Elmer's glue. Now I have mixed this in with 50% glue, 50% 
water. And the reason for that is, is not only does it help it to flow better, but it helps it to soak into the foam flock. And we're just gonna put this down everywhere where our dirt texture is. We can leave dirt in a few places if that's what you so want. Uh, in my case, I end up putting grass in only a few places and leaving dirt in others. And I think it looks really nice. Now keep in mind a really great way to kind of spread all this around is with a brush. You're gonna wanna use a brush that you don't use very often because eventually you will destroy this brush. No matter how much you think you're doing a good job at cleaning it out, eventually it will just be a lump and you won't be able to use it anymore. So try to use a cheap brush or one that you don't care about. Now my horrific camera skills aside, you can see here that I'm using some clump foliage. Now this is going to represent some small bushes and things like that. If you were going to make larger bushes, I recommend using a product called Liching or Liching. It depends entirely upon what part of the world you live in. It seems to go by both names. And then I recommend sprinkling a small amount of foam flock on top of it, locking it down with some watered down PVA glue. It's going to do a really great job at looking like a natural large bush. In my case, I didn't want any that was going to compete with the height of the dragon or blend the dragon into dramatically. If you really wanted to blend things in well, you could add a lot of small trees and things like that. There's a lot of really great products out there by Woodland Scenics and Notch and all kinds of other wonderful companies. However, once we get all of these in place, we're going to go ahead and we're going to use a spoon to kind of ladle out our foam flock. What this is going to do is it's going to do two things. It's going to allow us to be more controlled about where we put it. In this case, I'm trying Trying to make sure it goes into very specific places getting right up along the edges of our rocks and things like that but also if you were to just sprinkle it by hand uh, you will make quite a large mess so uh, when it comes to basing I recommend either working over your tub or working with small amounts like I'm doing here with the spoon so that way you don't have a huge mess to clean up afterward so very similar to how we paint our models, a really great way to add volume is by using layers. So we started out with kind of a dark layer and now I'm sprinkling in a much brighter layer of green. I'm not going super heavy with this, I'm just kind of putting a little bit all over. I probably could have done with a little less than what I ended up using, but it worked out fine in the end. Now, depending upon how old your ruins are, there's going to be a lot of moss and vines kind of growing all over everything. And depending on the products that are available to you, you're going to want to imitate that. The cheapest and easiest way to do is to continue with the same foam flocks we're using for grass, but to just go very sparingly. Now, this is the time where I recommend trying to put the least amount on the model as possible when applying it to your bricks. And what that's going to do by just putting a very light sprinkle across the surface, as opposed to putting a thick coat of, it's going to look more like moss and little bits and things that are kind of growing on the rock, as opposed to just a thick mat of grass. Now oftentimes we say less is more, and that can oftentimes be the case with these large bases, but sometimes more is also more. And feel free to kind of experiment and go over the top with these large bases, as it's some of the few opportunities we as miniature painters get to really go crazy with a lot of the more regularly used products for other hobbies like model railroading. I know that there are several other products that I would like to add to this when we go to actually paint the dragon, but I can't put those in place until the dragon is glued down. So for now, this is where we're at. Well, I don't know about you, but I am super excited to actually crack in there and really start working on this dragon. I've got some very interesting plans that I'm looking forward to putting into effect. There are some things that I have learned from recently working on a Lizardman army, as well as some other YouTube videos that have been published recently by some of my favorite people that have really inspired me to kind of change how I paint lizards in general. And I'm really looking forward to getting to share that with you guys. But for now, this is where we're going to leave things. I have another video planned for next week, but we'll be right back soon with the actual dragon the week after. I hope you guys have enjoyed today's video. And as always, may your display case always be filled and your pile of shame never run empty. Until next time.